I am well aware I haven't uploaded in a while. School is tiring me out as it will in the future, and recently I had my wisdom teeth removed, which was not a very fun event. There was a lot of blood. I didn't choose any of that stuff myself, mind you, but there was a lot of stuff that needed done. However, I will typically try to make Russia videos in December. Yes, I know they're committing war crimes in Ukraine. No, it will not stop me. I totally abhor what they're doing, but there's no reason to take that out on medieval Russia. So last Rushember, we looked at their expansion into Siberia, which I still loved making and regarded as one of my better videos. Today we will be doing the opposite, how Russia expanded into Europe. We'll start with the founding of the city-state of Muscovy to... I don't know, whenever. This video is only covering the expansion of medieval Russia into the rest of Europe. It is not a rundown of their whole history, only how it got bigger over time. Alright. Yeah, welcome to 2022, where the score's made up and the points don't matter. Our parable, a story if you will, begins in 1263 under the Golden Horde. At this time, the Mongol Empire had controlled a vast portion of the Old World, but like Rome, it became too big to manage. It split itself up into four different quarks, the Golden Horde in Eastern Europe and Kazakhstan, the Ilkhanate in the Middle East, mostly Turkey, Persia, and Iraq, the Chagatai Khanate in Central Asia, and the Yuan Dynasty in Eastern Asia, mostly China, Tibet, and a chunk of Siberia. Although it was still technically one empire, realistically, all four food groups were now on their own, so, you know, not really. Now, most of these four totally annexed their conquered territories, but the Golden Horde didn't. A sizable chunk of it was this multifarious Frankenstein patchwork of Eastern European slash Russian city-states it left unannexed to squabble amongst themselves. One of these was Muscovy, the origin seed of modern Russia. The Mongols were brutal in this cold land. They destroyed their city-state of Vladimir, Kiev was burned down and razed, Ryazan got sacked, and more. Older cities like Kostroma in the north were attacked but not gone. However, in their wake were three cities who rose from the ashes. Muscovy, centered around Moscow, Tver, centered around Tver, is it Tver, Tver, Tver? and Nizhny Novgorod, centered around Nizhny Novgorod. This period of Mongol rule over the Russian city-states was known as the Mongol Tartar Yoke, which applies to everything in the Golden Horde more broadly. Mongols and Tartars aren't technically the same thing, but they're both extremely close people groups, so for all intents and purposes, you know that when I say Tartar, we're talking about Mongols, but everyone else around them called them Tartars. So in 1263, Muscovy was ruled by its first actual leader, named Daniel of Moscow, aka Daniel Alexandrovich. Daniel belonged to the Rorik branch of the Russian royalty, and Moscow was quickly becoming a rising power after having secured independence from its neighboring state of Vladimir, and actually annexed them in 1328. As the 1300s chugged along, the power of the Mongols and the Golden Horde began diminishing, and Muscovy took delight in filling this vacuum. It expanded again in 1362, and would continue to do so until 1462, when Ivan III came into power. Desperately wanting to expand Russia and get access to the sea, he goes into power mode and almost instantly begins to conquer the remaining tiny Russian city-state remnants. Ivan III invaded the bigger Russian state of Novgorod, which was always up north and was sort of a big brother to Muscovy, but had become weak. Ivan eyed this up. In 1478, he conquered Novgorod and absorbed it, gaining a gigantic amount of land, and, for the first time, Russia had land along the White Sea. Finally, in 1480, Ivan III officially declared independence and kicked out the Mongols, detaching themselves from the Golden Horde. Muscovy was now on its own, and pretty massive compared to other European powers. This is also the time when Russia got a god complex. In 1472, the collapsed Byzantine Empire let Ivan III marry Byzantine princess Sophia Palaiologina. Additionally, Muscovy was super orthodox Christian, just like the Byzantines. Muscovy had basically said they're the successors of the Roman Empire. Moving on, the Golden Horde's severely declined state led to its splitting into Khanates, or areas ruled by a Mongol ruler, or Khan. The main two were the Kazan Khanate and the Astrakhan Khanate, and keep in mind that these sit on the absolute fringes of Europe, debatably spilling into Asia. These were made up of a fair mix of white people and Central Asians descended from the Mongols. At the time, a decent chunk of Eastern Europe was actually Central Asian or Turkic, and sometimes even Muslim. It certainly didn't resemble the west of Europe, another of which being the Crimean Khanate. 
Crimea and surrounding areas by the Sea of Azov were at one point populated by Byzantine Greeks, Slavs, and Huns, but were either subjugated or totally pushed out and replaced by the advancing Tartar Mongols. Remember, oftentimes whenever the Mongols invaded a place, they frequently raided and replaced the local population or made a very large minority even in warmer and drier parts of Eastern Europe. The Crimean Khanate was headed by a Mongol named Menli I Gire at the time of Ivan III. To protect Muscovy from Menli and his Crimean Tatars, he fortified his country's southern areas. These guys will come up in the future. This is also around when Muscovy implores the use of Cossacks. The Cossacks are people we've all heard of, let's explain. They're basically an ethnic. no... lingui- eh, no... semi-independent group of Ukrainians who lived mostly east of the Dnieper River and west of the Volga River. They often rode on horseback and used sabers and were really cool. Now that Russia is the undisputed Slavic champion, they will frequently use the Cossack people to defeat various enemies. BT dubs, Muscovy has also conquered a bit of land from Lithuania, so here's this chunk. In 1533, Ivan IV, aka Ivan the Terrible, battered up on deck. Little happened until 1547 when he crowned himself Tsar. Hey, that kind of sounds like Caesar. Hmm. He was coronated in a Byzantine fashion, continuing this whole Rome thing. With this came Muscovy's name change into the Tsardom of Russia, so finally, you know, that's awesome. From that point on until his death, Tsar Ivan the Terrible got his country embroiled into many wars with mixed results. His biggest failure was his involvement in the Northern Crusades, which was basically various German attempts at Christianizing the gosh darn evil pagans in the Baltic states, mostly Latvians and Estonians and other small groups. This was going poorly, so Ivan III was like, well, time to sneak in. Doing this would allow Russia to spread orthodoxy and assimilate them into Russian society. This conquest, called the Livonian War, actually failed as well, and at the end, Russia only got this slice of northern Estonia. Additional wars of Ivan IV include the annexation of both the Kazan and Astrakhan Khanates, adding a sizable chunk of land into Russia, as well as ethnic minorities like the Bashkirs, Tatars, Meri, Udmorts, Chuvash, and more. These people were not Russian. They were either Central Asian, Mongol, or Finno-Ugric, and they had their own languages and culture. Over time, Russia will begin to spread Orthodox Christianity into their lands, pacifying them and assimilating slowly into Russian culture. He also began threatening the Siberian Khanate as well, which was past the Euro Mountains and into Asia, almost as if I made a video about this before. Let's pause. Before we continue, we have to talk about geography. No, I don't care if you don't want to. Russia historically had been a landlocked state, and when it finally did get access to the sea, it was the White Sea, part of the Arctic. It's very cold, frozen over with pack ice for half the year, and basically only acts in liquid water form for like five months. Nevertheless, the town of Arkhangelsk was built far up north, along where the northern Dvina River meets the Cold Sea in 1584. It was Russia's first port city and connection to the outside world via water. Skip to when they conquered the Khanates of Kazan and Astrakhan. Russia now had access to three major bodies of water, those being the Don River, the Volga River, and the Caspian Sea. All three of these stay warm year-round and have been a host to a multitude of wild nomadic tribes. The land around this area is considered to be Eastern European and part of the wider Eurasian steppe, which is basically a vast expanse of rolling flatlands that spreads all across Eurasia. At the time, Russia was not seen as one of Europe's main players. It sat in a remote, cold corner of Europe, and much of Western Europe certainly recognized it as a massive power quickly rising in influence, but not to the level of France or Spain or the Holy Roman Empire. It sat on the absolute fringes of Europe and was seen as kind of backwards and relatively uneducated, but guarded the rest of the continent from Turkic barbarians, not dissimilar to how the Byzantines did. However, as it began to expand, its gargantuan size would begin to force the rest of Europe's hand into giving it a seat at the adults' table. It really can't be understated how important the Don and Volga rivers and the Caspian Sea are to Russia, and even though they were only recently conquered, quickly became the country's lifeblood. Around this era, Russia's main sources of money were coming from trade, furs from animals like the European beaver, deer, and elk, slaves, and beeswax products produced by its new Turkic people, the Bashkirs. It also helped that large cities such as Kazan, which sits at the confluence of the Volga and Kazanka rivers, acted as a mishmash of people groups trading goods and was a sort of like a layover spot at the time, a truly impressive city. To their east lie the Ural Mountains, the mountain range that divides Europe from Asia. 
They would soon penetrate this after the conquering of the Siber Khanate, but go watch this video for that. See how cute I made this? It's like a choose-your-own-adventure thing. Continue watching their conquest of Europe or see their conquest of Siberia play out. By the way, remember the Cossacks from earlier? This is where Russia begins to send them into Siberia to colonize it with white Orthodox people. How's that for a loop around? Anyway, this is also when the Stroganov family, who you may have heard of before, got their riches and power, colonizing activities. Russia will continually send its white Orthodox settlers into these conquered areas, displacing the Central Asian tribes, but certainly not without a fight. In 1558, the city of Astrakhan was refounded in a sense by Russia along the Volga River, specifically its delta along the Caspian Sea, and became a popular trading post and caravan site on the fringe of the Central Asian deserts and steppes. At the time, it was a hodgepodge of different religions, languages, people groups, and everything, but has mostly become assimilated into Russian culture in the modern era. But still, the conquering of these Khanates not only brought Tartar and other Central Asian people into a mostly white and Slavic Russia, but also introduced Islam, the dominant religion of Central Asia, and a big chunk of the Tartars. Hey, remember the Crimean Tartars? Ivan the Terrible defeats them again and continually gets ever closer to that sweet, sweet Black Sea. Do it, Russia. Complete the trifecta. Right before Ivan the Terrible died, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth went to war with them and took advantage of Russia's aging crazy czar and infighting, nabbing the Piskov region. They'll get it back later. In 1596, Russia's new czar and Ivan's son, Fyodor I, settled the border between them and the Swedish Empire in the Karelia region, this wiener-shaped part of Europe up here that didn't have many people except the Sami and Finns. In 1605, the Polish-Muscovite War began, when Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth went to war. The PLC did really well, making many attempts to barge deep into Russian territory, actually capturing Moscow in 1610 and installing a puppet czar. They used the power of the Zaporizhian Cossacks against Russia. Remember, we went over them before, but they're not unique, they're just a different flavor of Cossack. Zaporizhia is a large region in central Ukraine. However, the PLC was expelled from Moscow in 1612, and wouldn't you know it, a new dynasty appears. Out with the Rurikids, in with the Romanovs. Just when Russia thought it was over, Sweden went to war with them. Skip details. Sweden won in 1617, and Russia was forced to cede Ingria and the southernmost blips of Karelia. In 1634, Russia pursued another adventure in Central Asia, conquering the Nogai Horde, another Central Asian Muslim horde, though it wasn't fully annexed, yet. In 1654, the Russo-Polish War began, fought by Russia and the PLC, for like the third time. It was caused by a rebellion of the Zaporizhian Cossacks against the PLC, and they asked Russia for their help. The Cossacks' leader, Bogdan Kimelnitsky, swore allegiance to Russia if they helped, and Russia was like, yeah, why not? War! The PLC started off poorly and continued to do poorly as their economy tanked, unable to stand up to the Russians. They surrendered and gave a lot of territory to the Tsardom, finally making Russia the undisputed great power of Eastern Europe in 1667. Here's a current view of the Russian Empire in the year 1700 with their famous Tsar, Peter the Great. See all that land? Look at how much great stuff you missed out on by not watching my Siberia video. Anyway, Pyotr sought to modernize Russia, transforming it into some cold backwater nation of carnies to a modernized European colonial power. At the same time, the Great Northern War began, where he made amends with the PLC to jointly fight Sweden, who was a powerhouse at the time. Russia flipped the table against Sweden in 1709 with the Battle of Poltava. This war ended in 1721 thanks to Pyotr's imperial advancements like the navy, and ceded the regions of Ingria and Livonia towards Russia. They got them back, guys. We did it. Towards the start of the war, in 1703, Russia built up the city of St. Petersburg, named after the Tsar himself, of course, as an outpost, situated where the Gulf of Finland meets Ingria. At the end of the war, it was named Russia's new capital, depriving the historic city of Moscow of the title. This city was strategically located and began to grow in size, becoming the second largest city in Russia eventually behind Moskva. In 1721, Tsar Pyotr renamed the Tsardom of Russia into the Russian Empire after nearly two centuries. With all these wins, Russia slowly began to amass a collection of warm water ports around Europe. One year before Pyotr died, in 1724, Russia conquered the Kalmyk Khanate, yet another Buddhist-slash-Central Asian monarchy. Again, it wasn't annexed, but it was placed under Russian hegemony. Looks like the empire's shaping up. 1737, the city of Tolyadi is founded along the Volga River. Just look at those black poplars. Enter the Ottoman Empire down south. 
The Ottomans weren't doing all that great at the time. Taking advantage, Russian Empress Catherine the Great waged two wars on them from 1768 to 1792. The first one resulted in the control of the Crimean Khanate, which the Ots supported. Get that squared away, finally. And the second one let Russia control Moldavia. And she expelled the Black Sea Cossacks into the Kuban region. You know, to protect the Russian speakers there. Hmm. Anyway, Russia now had access to the Black, Azov, Caspian, Baltic, Arctic, and Pacific Seas. What's next? The Aral? <laughs> In 1771, the Kalmyks got absorbed fully. Alright. Whoa, here comes a big one! In a joint three-way war against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Russia, Austria, and Prussia teamed up together to divide the PLC. Obviously, the three amigos won, and the PLC got their shorts pulled over their head. By the way, 1783, the city of Sevastopol is founded in Crimea as a naval base. Look at how cool this place is. In 1796, Russia ended up with this large partition of pull lithuanian land. That's something. Towards the end of the late 1700s was Russia's expansion into Nova Russia. Nova Russia, or New Russia, was the empire's term for this whole chunk of southern Ukraine they conquered from the Crimean Khanate from before. The empire sent white Orthodox Slavs into this territory to settle it, with the aim of de-Islamizing and de-Tartarizing it, which would also help it fight a quicker war with the Ottomans in the future. Around 1800, Russia was able to secure most of the Caucasus to prevent the very Christian kingdom of Georgia from the doggone Persians, but it was really just an excuse to get more land. We are now at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, 1815. Tsar Alexander I attacked the French puppet state of Sweden in 1809 to get Finland off them, revenge for all the times they fought in the past and Sweden tried to diddle the Russian nation. This was a success, and Russia finally captured Finland. They took Moldavia from the Ottomans and Poland from Poland. At the same time, they invaded the Caucasus and absorbed most of it, only leaving behind the Circassians for a bit. In 1832, the frozen island Novaya Zemlya was annexed by Russia, even though nobody was living there and it's pretty useless. Don't shoot the messenger. In 1848, they went to war with the nomadic Kazakhs and absorbed land around the Aral Sea, defeating them in 1863, but not before annexing the Circassians in 1861. This land in Europe is basically what they would stay with until 1922 when the Russian Empire fell and became the Soviet Union, losing a significant chunk of land to their nations that sprung up from out of their wake. In 1926, the USSR discovered this tiny frozen archipelago at the top of the globe called Franz Josef Land. At the end of World War II, the Soviet Union gained these lands in West Ukraine, Moldova, Ruthenia, West Belarus, Kaliningrad, and the Baltics. They would hold on to this land, spreading communism and revolutionary zeal until the collapse of the Red State in 91, leaving behind the Russia we know and sometimes like today. Okay, bye bye Well, that's the end of this flick, friends. I'll see you all in 2023. What an exciting year for me. I hope you guys weren't too saddened by this one. I get it might not have been 110% worth the wait, maybe more like 70%. Anyways, I just want you guys to know that I'm here for you, you know? And who knows what I'll do next. January is gonna have some wacky stuff maybe, but I don't know yet. Okay, so that's the tea, sis. My voice hurts.